Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Narrow Gate. V, this is a special week coming up, isn't it? It is. And uh, what is coming up? Uh, this week, let's see. I'll be preaching in Luke chapter 7, where Jesus raises a widow's son to life. I mean... That's all I got so far, Dougie. No, Danielle, it's, Danielle it's flew up north with her sister. No, no, no. All right. This is the intro. Shh, shh, shh. Sunday is something that we call in the church calendar Palm Sunday. Okay. So, Next yeah. Week is that. That's that what begins. I thought you were referring to. Next week, Good Friday, Re week. Resurrection Sunday. Okay. Holy week. And we have Good Friday and we have Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. And um, really, it's in the church calendar. That is, this is the week, man. Christmas is great. All for it. But this week coming up is really important. So on the narrow gate, I thought that you, Dr. Andrew Buxick, and I, Doug Howe, would would reflect on um, that Passion Week uh, from good from Palm Sunday through to Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And with this kind of thought, um, we certainly had views of all these things when we were in seminary together in, in 1999 through 2003. Yeah. Since then, we preached a lot of Easter services. We preached a lot of Good Friday and Palm Sunday. And you've probably learned a lot. I certainly have learned some things that I did not know when we were in seminary. Um, and I thought, Maybe just to reflect on those and, and kind of for us and our viewers from all over the world that um, we could all talk and think about this week that's coming up for the next two uh, podcasts. What do you think? I think it's great. Can I share with you something I learned? Just yeah. Kind of kick off this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, actually, all, Passion Week began on Monday. It depends on, you Jesus, say tomato, I say tomato. Jesus entered, you know, uh, his triumphant em entry into um, into Jerusalem, and then he weeped over the city Monday. Wept over the city. Yeah, but we have Palm Sunday, so that's what we're talking about. Okay, that's, that's why I was a little confused about this week. Well, I'm you're, like, mm, you're, I'm you're pretty really done. So why don't you just wait and correct me when we get to no, Palm Sunday? No, why I would never uh treat you today like i used to treat you in seminary correct me <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm look, kidding you <laughs> look i want you to pray i will do that and then we'll catch up and then okay. we're right into the sunday when jesus walked into jerusalem <laughs> <laughs> he walked in right he's printed it um, some yeah. say it's monday some say sunday yeah okay Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to pray. <laughs> You're funny, Douglas. Okay. Let me get serious here. Lord, thank you um, for your perfect life that you lived for us. Oh, first of all, to bring glory to God and also to live that perfect life for us in our place, because we obviously could never do it. And your perfect righteousness has been credited to us. Thank you also, Lord, for Passion Week, uh, preparation for that which you would endure on Friday, where you, the perfect one of heaven, God who took on flesh, the sinless one, would go to a cross, not because of anything you had done, but because of everything that we had done in opposition to God, in rebellion to God. And Lord, you who knew no sin became sin for us. You were punished for our sins. You bore the wrath of God that was meant for us. Right before you gave up your spirit, you declared paid in full. You died and three days later, Resurrection Sunday, that first Lord's Day, you rose in victory, demonstrating 
very clearly that which you had earlier declared, you absolutely did. You rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. And through you, Lord, we have forgiveness of sins. Through you, we have the free gift of eternal life. And because you live, we too will live forevermore. How grateful we are to you, first and foremost, because of who you are. And also because what you have done on behalf of us. Again, bringing glory to God and also bringing salvation to us, the unworthy ones. We will spend eternity thanking you, praising you, worshiping you. And Lord, as we look forward to that time, the certainty of that time, may we start now that which we will be doing forevermore. Praising you, thanking you, worshiping you. Because you are the majestic, merciful Messiah. You are our Lord, our God. We love you because you loved us first. And we thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Solid right there. Well, Thanks for joining us for the Narrow Great Gate. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Covers it, baby. Why don't we? Why don't we do um, uh, a Narrow Gate? What do we call episode? What do we call it? Episode film? I don't know what it's called. Um, you've got young. You've you've got young adults. What do they call this? Dad going into the den and yelling at his old friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so whatever this is called. I have an idea. Why would we not do a, 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 a narrow gate uh, every day during Passion Week? Wow. I mean, because there's a lot there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. In two weeks, I, you know, I just was thinking of it. Easter kind of creeps up on me all the time. I don't know about you, but I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's April 4th. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not you, I guess. Okay. Well, you know, um, so not really, because when you're in the Bible all the time, you kind of can't help but be reminded uh, of, the, of the resurrection. And don't talk about the resurrection just on Easter Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> and neither do you, because if you did, I would be up in Virginia in a second. I know, I know. Um, yeah, so Pasha, well, that, that's certainly an option. Um, if you can find a guest host for all the other days, that's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so you said it. There's a lot of stuff that happens in past oh. week. I was thinking we do have Palm Monday. We could talk about what you've said, and that's one interesting thing. So Palm Sunday is actually a misnomer. You're saying it's Palm Monday. No, there's nothing wrong with celebrating Palm Sunday. Uh, but I think most commentators, most scholars would believe Passion Week began on that Monday, right? Uh, and it, especially as you walk through Luke, and I know you're teaching out of Luke, right? Mm -hmm. you know, you'll get to, I mean, you'll see Luke is very, again, as a historian, he's very chronological in Passion Week, and that's where we kind of get the, um, uh, that order, so. But, All right. Well, yeah. so, Paul, but, but when he went into Jerusalem, that final time that we call Palm Sunday, is part of the Passion Week. That's the yes, part. absolutely. That begins it, right? You've got you've got Palm Palm Sunday. I mean, I'm not even trying to short change anything, but you got Palm Sunday. Um, you've got other events that happen. Then we get the the Upper Room, um, which is um, John kind of felt like the Upper Room was semi important because he takes chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and that's the Upper Room. Yeah. Um, so he takes a, a chunk of his book, and he says, this is one of the things that I want to focus on. Then you have the arrest, and you have the, the accusations, and the trial, and then he goes before Pilate, and then you have the, 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 the traveling to the crucifixion site. You have the crucifixion. You have people taking the body away you have the time period in between you have resurrection sunday and you have the reaction of everybody 
to that. So there is a lot of stuff to cover and, and I, we will not touch on all of it, certainly. But I thought I would ask you just what, you know, your, your thoughts, maybe starting with Palm Sunday, things that reflections or scriptures that you think we should look at or uh, how other people may um, be able to reflect and meditate during this week. Well, you know, um, you know, as our Lord, it, it's interesting. We know, in fact, let's just go. I mean, we'll stay in Luke. Um, first of all, go to Luke uh, 19. And we can just bracket this together. Uh, Doug, we were a bit ignorant, I think, by not saying hello to Chicho, Dayon in Macedonia. Well, you got to explain what Chicho means. Yeah, I don't Chicho know that is like a term of affection, like uncle, like, um, but it's a very like endearing term. So Chicho, you know what I'm saying? What would, what would be an English term? Buddy? Pal? No, uh, no. Um, Brother? Chachi? I, for maybe a female, like auntie. Auntie. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't know how you would how you would refer to a male. My my cousins called my dad unk. Yeah, like a term of endearment. Something. But he's not your uncle. What's that? He's not your uncle. Well, but who Dayon? You mean? Yeah. Well, I, I don't I don't know why we call him Chicho. Uh, Dayon, let me see you. Well, you obviously. There he comes. Look how you see how that works, Dougie. Technology. Yeah. There he is. There's our our uncle Dayon. So we I, can't call him uncle because he's younger than us. But to call him Chicho is like, you know, he's one of us. Great. Okay. I understand now. <laughs> Listen, I'm, hey, I had to learn all that talk. I mean, you know. Now, just stay on. Let me ask you a question. Do you call Andrew Chicho or is that? Well, uh, Sometimes I call him Chichko. 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 Uh, it's uh, you're uh, older than me. No, no. Um, uh, it's with instead respect. of Doug, Dougie, or Douglas. It would be with respect, right? Oh, okay. Chichko. Yeah. <laughs> See, Doctor yeah. Chichko to you, Dan. <laughs> okay. He's my Chicho. You know what I'm saying? He's my yeah, Chicho. All right. Hey, well, I just wanted to, because some people wouldn't have known that. I hear you call him that a lot. So, yes. but other people might go, I wanted to call him Chicho. You, I don't know if you've ever heard me call him Dayon Cho. No. Yeah, the Cho. That's kind of like, um, instead of dad, daddy. Um, uh, you know. Yeah, we, we get it. We get yeah. it. It's like Dougie. Doug and Dougie. It's yes, saying, there you go. Yeah. yeah. He's my, he's my, he's my uh, Dayon Cho, Chicho. <laughs> be nice to him he basically controls right there he's like that i tell you what he is like um the wizard of oz he is he's the wizard of oz sitting there with his oak Ridge lake background and he just hits buttons and basically he controls us here <laughs> dayon how are you doing uh thank you for asking i'm just fine yeah nothing special on no, my side you Good, good. How's the weather there, Mac Macedonia? Uh, okay, on Monday we have snow and it was really cold, and today it's sunny, warm. And really? So on. Yeah, we call this month of the year, month of the year, crazy March. Aha. Uh -huh. And Doug, what do you call this month of the year? Well, we similarly have, Dan, our, our, our phrase in America is March comes in like a lion and leaves like a lamb. Uh -huh. So it comes in with winter and cold, but then spring comes. That's why I'm wearing this shirt. One of the things, I'm, I lived in Florida and I love it. I know you love Florida, Andrew. That's great. I do like the change of seasons, even though it's cold and dark and rainy and snowy and dead in the winter, this is a beautiful time as things start Spring. to sprout yeah. and grow and blossom. And it's such a wonderful reminder of new life that happens because of Passion Week. Oh, look, did you see that? Yeah, well, I kind of 
two things. Um, did it take you and Sarah a, a while to get used to it? I mean, because you were down here in South Florida and then moved to Virginia. Was it first couple winters tough to get used to? No, no, it was you get to wear warm clothes. I mean, yeah. part of it is you go, hey, I got a new outfit. And then that gets old. Well, um, Danielle and I, when we moved to Croatia, we moved there, it would have been, what, what month? October. So literally fall was, go you know, we got there, you know, you, the leaves are changing, you know, Danielle's all happy. She goes, look at this, it reminds me growing up in Pennsylvania and all that. And then like overnight, you know, snow. And I'll never forget this little apartment we were renting at first. Um, she go, she, you know, she's like, come out here. She was like, you know, all excited. We're out on this little balcony and we see the snow. After that, it literally would get dark. What time, Chicho? Three, four o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, four. Four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And just dreary. It was hard to, to adjust to that for us. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is hard. Very tough. So, um, but here, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're just loving everyday sunshine. Second of all, Douglas, Dougie. I teed it up for you when Dayon said, Kaksuzove March, Tamo? Oh, uh, na Hrvatski? Ne, 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 ta fraza, što si reka? Aha, uh, crazy. Aha, so mar uh, crazy March. Doug, I teed March Madness, I get it. Oh. Yeah, we have something called March Madness here. Yes, explain to, to explain to Chicho because he has no idea what you were saying. Chicho, if I may, Chicho Ko. Uh, the we have universities. They have basketball teams. I'll do this because I'm an okay. idiot. Um, and they have a tournament where they invite sixty four teams to compete in a round robin tournament to find out who the best team in the country is, and that happens in March. Um, and, uh, and, and it's called March Madness called because March Madness the because schools, the fans, I mean, Chicho, it's something huge here because you, all the colleges have all their students and fans come and, and it's very, but this year is different because you don't really have many fans, right, Dougie? You don't have fans, but for fans, we, you, you try to pick all the games at the very beginning and try to pick who's going to win and you get your friends together and you compete against each other and, it's a big time um, and a pretty big waste of time too when it ultimately comes. <laughs> oh, it is interesting, right? I mean, especially as you get closer towards the finals. Uh, Chicho, it's, it's similar to like the World Cup, you know, that yeah. whole process there, what you guys deal with, right? Yes, I understand. Yeah. All right. So Chicho is dealing with Crazy March. Dougie is dealing with March Madness. Yeah. And, so I'm, I'm wait, and I'm waiting to talk about Jesus. Well, okay, I will go now. Bye bye. <laughs> Chicho, you're allowed to stay. On. <laughs> I mean, just for the listeners, don't worry. He does <laughs> know a lot about Jesus. <laughs> he does. And it's not like he doesn't want to hear about Jesus. He just doesn't want to be seen. Like, I'm done. <laughs> Dougie, you know what that reminds me of? And no. we may have talked about this on our previous, whatever we call these things. Remember the first time, remember uh, our senior pastor, David Nicholas, we were in seminary class, you know, remember how big he was and tall and he used to sit back on his chair with, you know, his hand, do the hand thing, Dougie. Oh, his hands were. <laughs> exactly, right? And he would point, his finger was like this long, right? He, for those who are listening, we say this lovingly, he was a, a college basketball player, right? Was it yep. University of Miami? Mm -hmm. way back when but i mean he was six five six six right and for back then that was i mean that's like a center right yeah. and uh so he was a big man big hands and I remember when he would baptize babies right oh, uh yeah. and up on it and he would literally like pawn the baby with one hand and everybody in the congress oh. <laughs> He wouldn't lift the baby up. I mean, it wasn't like that. But <laughs> right. He would just grab the baby. Man. But um, so he was doing one of those things, starting the beginning of a summer class. He's doing the hands and all that. And like, you, 
you know how his mind always raced, right? All of a sudden, boom, something comes. And he turns and looks at me, right? We were sitting in this large <laughs> semicircle. You always sat next to me, remember? I always sat like at the, the – I was the very first one in that horseshoe, right? Yep. You were always next to me. Yep. And um, what did he say to me? Andrew, you're going to be pre preaching. <laughs> like – Preaching where? <laughs> I'd only been in ministry just a couple months. I left the business. You know, he goes, you're going to be preaching. Uh, where? <laughs> the worship center. What I, I, just, I did a day on what I do. You closed your book. You grabbed your bag. You stood up and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> did I say anything? We didn't know if you were coming back. <laughs> I'm telling you, I almost did. The like, hot looks. <laughs> <laughs> Is he? <laughs> I think David went. Ah, he'll be back. He'll be back. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Oh, so when Chicho right now just abruptly like just ended, it kind of reminded me of that, right? I'm going to leave now. All right. We're in Acts chapter 17. We're going to... No, gonna, or... No. Luke, Luke chapter 17. Or chapter 19. 19. All right. You okay? Yeah. Oh, that we had a good laugh. That was funny. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, gosh. So, um, what, I think the question was you know, something that really um, uh, over the years of preaching and, and, you know. What have you learned? What, what discoveries learned. did you make? What did you, do you see now that you maybe you didn't see? Yeah, I think um, just the depth of emotions, um, you know, in verse 28, you know, it talks about how he was going up to Jerusalem. This was going to be his triumphal entry. Um, he ap approached verse 29, Mount of Olives. He had told his, a few of his disciples to go into the village and to, you know, get a, you know, grab a, a colt, everything. Our Lord had providentially uh, organize everything in advance for his triumphal entry. We know that he was fulfilling scripture, you know, Zechariah chapter nine, coming in on the colt, all that on the donkey. And um, we see the, you know, large crowd that was following him. And we read in verse 37 and 38, um, as our Lord was approaching Jerusalem near the descent of Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples, some who were real disciples, many of whom were not, right? Um, because again, our Lord was literally a, a, a walking school, right? I mean, you know, people were following him and he was doing a lot of his teaching as he was walking. So he had a large crowd following him, obviously many of them because they were just interested in all the miracles he was performing. Yeah, a walking school, but also a walking uh, circus, a walking, uh, not necessarily called Hospital, people. healing everybody. I mean, they, obviously no one had ever seen something like this. And so in verse 37, as our Lord is descending the Mount of Olives and about to come into Jerusalem, uh, Look at the the what how the crowd responded. They began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And then quoting from Old Testament in Psalm 118, they were shouting, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. So you see this height of emotions, the crowd the king was entering Passion Week. But then you see the opposite end of the emotions. Verse 39, the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, stop them, rebuke your disciples. Did, do you see it, Dougie? Mm-hmm. 
And our Lord said in verse 40, I tell you, if these, the disciples become silent, the stones will cry out. Testify about our Lord, right? And so you see this, you know, and again, remember our Lord, omniscient, knowing what this entrance meant, right? Mm -hmm. He was coming into Jerusalem to die. And so you've got this large crowd praising God for him laying the palm branches, you know, the cloak, all that. You've got the religious hypocrites who were going to be involved a few short days later in not just plotting the death of Christ, but carrying it out. Yeah. Giving money to Judas and, and all that stuff, the, the false trials and all that. And so can you imagine, Doug, our Lord, all this happening. And again, this isn't something new I learned. You know, I obviously studied this in seminary, but just the depth of it, you know, you kind of put yourself in that position and go, wow. You know, so again, probably not the best illustration, but as we talked about March Madness, it's kind of like you got one, <laughs> you got two things like, you know, one group whose team is winning, yeah, the other team, you know. It just, you see that happen. And then look at our Lord. Wait, before you go on, just yeah. one thought. Right in that moment, something that I, I, and like you say, this isn't necessarily new, but it's, it's a deeper appreciation for our understanding of this idea. His disciples, and when, when, you know, as you pointed out, when Luke is saying disciples, he's talking about all the people that are there. But he also has 12 who are his closest disciples who are there as well. Yeah. And it's interesting that they have to be caught up in this as well. No doubt. They have to be saying, this is the greatest day, certainly of our time with Jesus. Well, and my whole for, life. think about what Judas may have been thinking at this point. I'm on the winning team. Yeah. Right? Well, right. And so... And, and yet we know, because we know the rest of the story, that that is not what's going to happen. And Jesus knows that's what's not yes. going to happen. But here's what I think is cool. We don't see Jesus saying to disciples, knock it off. Yeah. I've been telling you guys, this is not the way it plays out. Right. He allows them to, to praise enjoy, God, to enjoy yeah. the worship that Jesus is rightfully getting. Yep. And whether it's misguided because they think he's a political king, yep. his point is this worship is happening all the time. We know that because when the Pharisees say, tell him to be quiet, he goes, if I do, the worship will still continue because I actually am the king, right. <laughs> but not right. like you think, right? Yeah. Um, so just that, that, like you said, with those emotions, because we're going to see a, a different side of Jesus here, and we're going to see kind of his emotional state. Yeah. But he allows the disciples to receive or be part of that. They're not they're not being praised and glorified. Right. He is. Yeah. But because they're with him, they are um they're receiving it as well. And not in not a bad way. And, and right. And I think another thing, that's a great point. Also I think our Lord, because again we know though uh, you know, our Lord, the, the Son of God, God the Son, the second person, the Trinity, uh, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, co-eternal, consubstantial. We know that Scripture tells us, Philippians 2, that God the Son humbled himself um, by leaving the glory that he enjoyed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He humbled himself. He took on flesh. He basically, the son of God became the slave of God, being obedient, even obedient to the point of death on the cross. Here on earth, our Lord, uh, though full, you know, truly God, also truly man, two natures, divine and human nature, we know that he willingly submitted to the will of the Father 
in the power of the Spirit. We see throughout Scripture, in the New Testament, Jesus said, I did not come to do my own will, but do the will of he, of he who sent me. And so I think also here, we see the emotions. I like what you brought up about the true disciples. I mean, they were obviously enjoying the praise that their master was receiving. Uh, we see the emotions of the, the, the religious hypocrites, disdain, uh, like bitterness. But think about also our Lord, as he obviously knows this is all happening. Think of the joy our Lord had. Because they were not simply praising Jesus, but again, they were praising God. Mm -hmm. And is that not the joy our Lord derived from seeing his father praised? Father's son and spirit are others focused yeah. and self-giving love. And so Jesus is thrilled so is the holy spirit that yeah. god the father is being praised Isn't and that great? and as you were talking i was thinking too in in a sense i mean we don't want to dismiss it jesus is going to say something in a moment that that shifts our tension of joy but for that moment all is right in the world mm. maybe not in everybody's heart maybe not in the religious and you say religious hypocrites i i would say religious zealots because I think we still have religious zealots today, and most people wouldn't say they're a hypocrite. Not that you're wrong. I just, there are religious zealots that would be saying this to Jesus. I don't know. That's just a thought. Yeah. But everything's right. This is the way it, it, it's actually, they're correct. God is being praised. They're correct in saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That is absolutely correct well and it was scriptural they were quoting psalm 118 they were singing psalm 118 in a sin scarred world that has been devastated by sin there is this moment where they where whether they know it or not jesus is being recognized for who he is and jesus is being proclaimed for what he brings peace yeah. um you know that's that's kind of cool in a sense and i think you're right so i think there was a part for Jesus, of him going, they're praising the Father. Yeah. Um, and 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 you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, know, right? You are great. That's well, good. again, our Lord, uh, you know, you referred earlier to um, John chapters 13 through 17, the high, his high priestly prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, theologians uh, call that, that uh, time in the upper room, uh, where he really... Again, in John 17, what did he say to his father? I have brought glory to you here on earth. Mm -hmm. And you see God being glorified through Christ and his disciples, right? And so that brings great joy to our Lord. Mm -hmm. But then verse 41, we see the opposite extreme of emotions from our Lord. Huh, huh Dougie? We see his mm -hmm. human nature. Verse 41, he approached Jerusalem, and when he saw the city, he wept over it. Wow. There's a lot going on here in terms of just emotional ups and downs, right? Mm-hmm. And what did our Lord say? Verse 42. Hmm. If you had known in this day even you, the things which make for peace. We had plenty of time, Dougie. And our Lord said to them, but now, these things have been hidden from your eyes. And then our Lord prophesied what was going to happen in Jerusalem because our Lord knew what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And as a result, our Lord pronounced judgment on Jerusalem. The days will come upon you 
when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you. He's referring to 70 AD when Roman army led by Titus came in and destroyed Jerusalem, the temple, and just slaughtered countless of Jews. The days will come upon you. And our Lord was what? What he was prophesying was going to happen less than 40 years later. Mm -hmm. When your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you and hem you in on every side, they will level you to the ground and your children within you. Oof. And they will not leave in you, i.e. Jerusalem, one stone upon another, because you did not recognize what? My Bible says the time of your visitation. That's what mine does as well. Now, isn't that interesting? The time of your visitation. In other words, the Jews understood what he was saying there. Again, just hop over real quick to Luke chapter 1. Again, you'd be very familiar with this, Dougie, because you've been preaching through Luke. Remember when uh, John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, was uh, unmuted, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, when John was born? And what happened in verse 67? And his father, i.e. John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For what, Dougie? He has visited and redeemed his people. Again, Zacharias understood that his son would be the forerunner. Here comes the promised Messiah. God finally, in a redemptive way, visiting his people. Again, we see verse 70 verses 78 uh actually verse 77 uh, let's start in verse 76 and you child he's prophesying over his son john the baptist will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go on now quoting isaiah before the lord to prepare his ways to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our god with which the sunrise, a re reference to the Messiah, from on high, finish the sentence. Visits us. Back to Luke 19, Dougie. How sad our Lord. Verse chapter 19, verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city mm -hmm. and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but, for, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why, Dougie? What did our Lord say? Because you didn't know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize me. You didn't understand me. You didn't receive me. You didn't believe me. You didn't trust me. Is that right? How sad. It is it sad. It kind of makes you, you know, it hits my heart. And, well, and we're going we're gonna to look at this because this is, this is incredible. And we're only going to talk about Palm Sunday today. Um, so we'll figure this out, fans. I don't know. It'll be fans? Every, what, what fans? <laughs> um, just, no, we'll figure this out, Andrew. A um, couple things that I'd like to comment on. He starts off by saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. And as, as you were reading that, I was even thinking, what, what are those things that we think will make for peace. And we see both sides of it, actually, in the triumphal entry. We see people thinking they're praising God for the king that's coming, but their, their idea, we believe, I think we can surmise, of what the king will do is very different than what the king does. And, and so what they think is going to bring them peace, and this is a generalization, but it is throwing off... Um, 
um, foreign oppressors. Yep. Ro- in that immediate context, yep. Roman oppression. Right. And, they, and we've seen that. We've seen that because we had to throw off Assyrian and Babylonian. And we've, that, that, but let's get that off. And then we'll be, yep. that will bring us peace as a people. Now, um, you had the religious zealots or hypocrites. They have an idea of what would bring peace in this situation, and they would say that Jesus is doing the opposite of that. Yep. So you have people who are saying, this is what's going to bring peace. The interesting thing is both those things have to do with human power. Yep. Um, so, so even in that little sentence, had on this day you would know the things that made for, uh, would you that you had know, known on this day the things that make for peace? You think you know what will bring peace, but you're wrong. And then that next line, it says, now they are hidden from your eyes. Mm. I definitely want to get your input on it. But here's what I would say, because you may read that. One may read that and say, but God's hiding this from you. I I think it's hidden from their eyes because they've already got their view of peace, what it it is and what it's brought in front of their eyes. It's hidden not by God, but by them and by their own views and actions and attitudes. Well, I think that, yes, no doubt, they're responsible for rejecting the sunrise. Correct. Dying there, right? I mean, you think about it over 30 years. The last three, three and a half years. I mean, right in front of them preaching the greatest sermons ever preached. You know, I mean, think about it, Dougie. I mean, he was a, I I was going to say he was a human healing machine, but what not human? I mean, God in the flesh, but I mean, he almost literally just emptied Israel of all diseases. Think about how many people were healed. Um, Fed people. I mean, think of what he did. Um, And yet, they rejected. He came to his own, his own rejected him. I think right here, again, what our Lord is saying, but now, that's it. I think this was God's judicial hardening. Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? How many times? God kept through Moses saying, let my people go one plague, next plague, next plague. And Pharaoh kept hardening his heart. And then finally, God let him go his own way. That was the final judicial hardening game over. Right. But, but I think it's important. There's a nuance there there because it's the, it's the Pharaoh that hardened his heart. Yeah. God simply said, you want a hard heart? You got it. It's similar to Romans chapter one that says he gave them over to their sinful desire. So, so there's these points where um, you have God reaching out. Listen, I got mercy for you. I love you. My love is never ending. We go, nope, 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 nope. And there's a point in time where that comes. And as you would say, it's kind of, you would say that God would go, okay. He gives them over. He lets it go, go with the way you want to go. What non-believers, which way do they want to go? As far away from God as possible, right? That's called God's wrath of abandonment. And God eventually gives them over. He did that with Pharaoh. Again, we see what our Lord is saying about Jerusalem. And it happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then interestingly, our Lord did not just prophesy that on Monday when he came into the city. Look what he did on Tuesday. Verse 45, he entered the temple and he cleaned house. He began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, it is written in my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. This was the second time our Lord cleansed the temple. The first time, as you know, was at the beginning of his earthly ministry, right? Mm -hmm. Um, After he had been baptized, after he had been led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days and 40 nights, he 
Uh, it was tempted by Satan. Our Lord came out of that wilderness as the conquering king. Uh, he eventually went up north, picked some of his early disciples, six of them to be uh, uh, exact, performed his first miracle up there in Cana, where he turned water into wine quick pick stop in Capernaum, and then brought the six down with him to Jerusalem. He made his entrance into Jerusalem. Here comes the king. This is at the beginning of his earthly ministry. And what was the first thing he did? He cleansed the temple. What was our Lord saying? This hypocritical house needs to be cleaned up now because it's my house. Fast forward now to the end of his earthly ministry, three years later. Nothing had changed, Dougie. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Jesus didn't preach good sermons? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I guess some of his miracles really didn't stick? Why? Because I guess our Lord was lying and they figured it out. Or better yet, he didn't live what he preached. So right here on Tuesday, again, he comes in Monday. Think of the emotions. People are praising God, praising him. Pharisees, scribes, upset, jealous. Rebuking our Lord. How about that one, Dougie? Our Lord weeping over Jerusalem. You see his heart, his compassion. It's not like he was like, oh, you're going to get it now. Right. And Tuesday, our Lord cleaned house saying this hypocritical religious system is coming down because what were they doing dougie they were leading people to hell it's interesting too um as he's weeping over the city with that whole idea of but now they are hidden from your eyes and, and we do have that idea of god saying okay the wrath of uh, abandonment, wrath or wrath of abandonment. Yep. Um, but he is speaking generally about Jerusalem because we're going to see in the Passion Week that there are people who come to know who he is. Very good. Very good. Great process. point. So, so in a sense, too, <laughs> if you feel like you've experienced God's wrath abandonment or you think your family member has, it's not it, it is not necessarily, you might not be right with that because yeah. God still, um, his mercy and grace can still extend and break. Well, through well that. that's a great point. And I'm not sure, Doug, that many non-believers ever think of that or say that. <laughs> well, that's what I would say. If someone says I'm worried about that, I yeah. say, well, then you're, that's a good sign. Yeah. Or that's a sign that you shouldn't worry. Um, because because you're thinking of spiritual things and you care. Well, you um, care what God thinks about you and you care about God's love for you and you don't want to experience God's wrath upon you. Hardened non-believer doesn't think of those things. Yeah, right, right. And so that, that's, uh, so we got, we, we got, you, you slipped us into Tuesday and I'm really glad about that with, with the cleansing of the temple, but that's all we got time for on, yeah. on today's narrow gate as we think about Holy Week and whether we do shows every day next week or just do one, I think we might be doing several, we might just work our way through um, Luke uh, to the resurrection. I think that's, a, I think that's and, a great idea, Dougie, because I think, again, just putting this together for people, you know, kind of each day of Passion Week um, might be a benefit. And, and Doug, how great is it for us? Yeah. For, for you and for me, just to, yep. again, we've preached this and we've, you know, but just it to is. be it, reminded. It's, of, it's, it's a blast. Yeah. It's a blast. Good. Um, I'm going to pray. Thank you. Father, we thank you for um, your word, and we thank you for this special time that we have um, just in this hour, but also um, in the days and this week coming up that we call Holy Week. I pray that for each of us, you will reveal more of yourself, more of your incredible story, and more of your incredible love that was expressed through Jesus Christ during this whole time. Um, 
And, and as Andrew has said, the more we know about him and about you, the higher our praise and worship is to you, because we understand how awesome you are and how grateful we are that in spite of the facts that we, we are, we came in rebellious. We talk about religious hypocrites. We were, are, we were those religious mm. hypocrites, even if we weren't religious, because we wanted nothing to do with you. And yet, you revealed this visitation that you came. And Jesus, you came to show us the heart of the Father and the heart of the Spirit and your heart. Um, so that's what I pray for people this week. And I pray that you are blessed as you consider uh, what Jesus has done for us and the beautiful words it has finished and what that means to you for eternity. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at you just getting more and more just reformed, total depravity, God's sovereign. Oh, Doug, when you speak like that, I want to weep. Do you know what I'm saying? Tears of joy. <laughs> if we go deep, I mean, we will. And if we get to the crucifixion and stuff, there are some things that are, that are interesting questions. But yeah, yeah. You're, one... you're not going to go off of, uh, you know, thousands of years of uh, firmly held orthodox theology. You're not going to start speculating. We won't let that no, happen. No, no, no. I'm not going <laughs> to go off that orthodox <laughs> theology. But there's some theology that came in about 600 years ago that's not uh, quite as ancient. There you go. Okay. All right. Good. Um, so I have a new name for you because I was so proud. Just, I'm telling you, you bless my heart with your prayer. Chiquico. Dougicho. Dougicho. No, 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 not with the, don't go up with it. Dougicho. Dougicho. Hey. All right, Andy. All right. Um, yeah, so next time we'll, we'll look at more of what happens during um, Holy Week, and um, there's a lot there. Okay, Doug Cho, you have a great day. Thank you. You too, my friend. Bye.